So I'm, I'm Jesse Michael. This is Mik Mickey Shkatov. <laughs> yes, nice. Is, is that close? No, okay. close enough. Right, right. Uh, we, we basically uh, or would like to come here and, and talk to you guys about some uh, USB uh, security issues that we've, that we've run into. And, and uh, uh, basically uh, what we do is we do uh, uh, product security and we keep running into security issues related to USB, but we'd, we'd kind of like to inspire people and like describe how to, how to get started looking at USB. And uh, so we're... We're, we're coming in and we, we're going to teach you some guys. Yeah. Teach um, you guys some stuff. So. We have like half an hour. Yeah. So we're going to run through a little bit of yeah. this. Yeah. Um, if you have any question, look for the guy in the blue mohawk or the red suit afterwards. Yes. Yeah. We're going to well, be walking we'll, the we'll floor. We'll be here all weekend, so yeah. just come, come see us. We can go into a lot more detail and, and just yeah. come find us. So. Yeah, go, go, going to this slide is slow. Uh, <laughs> sorry. So, so basically we, want, we wanted to, to come in and talk to you guys about USB security and uh, ex explain just how easy it is because there seems to be some misconceptions about how, how to even get started and what to look for and uh, why, why you even should. So like a lot of people think of USB as some academic thing or there, there actually is some interesting security, USB security research this year. So... I'm I'm kind of happy about that just because more people are looking at it, and we we basically wanted to come in and like let you guys understand that it's actually a lot easier to to get started with USB and why you should uh, why you should look at this. So like USB is in everything. So basically any device that you have, or any modern system is going to have a USB device. You plug USB devices in all the time and don't necessarily think about it. And it's, it's integrated into modern platforms in, in interesting ways that can have some, uh, some security ramifications that people don't really think about. And we, we just wanted to highlight some of that and uh, let you guys get started, essentially. So we, we did, didn't really want to focus on uh, the, the basics of USB other than just like pointing out that like, it, it's been around since like 1994. Uh, we started out with uh, the 1.1 spec that was officially re released in 94, and over the years we've eventually gone up from 1.5 megabit to like uh, 10 gigabit per second in 2013 with the 3.1 spec. And there's there's a variety of different device classes like uh, keyboards, mouse, uh, mass storage device, uh, video. We we were possibly going to be using a uh, USB. Uh, uh, VGA adapter because my my keyboard my laptop over here laptop over here wasn't working correctly but uh, it's it's used all over and people think about it a little bit but uh, we we just wanted to uh, bring bring some attention to some particular usage cases that uh, some people don't necessarily think about and we think are kind of important. So there, there's there's basically like the the four the we're, we're kind of going to kind of rush through the the basics but there's basically the 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 four main pins there's a VCC then the the data plus and minus uh, differential pair and ground and then the mini and micro pin has uh, connector has the uh, on the go ID pin just to to be able to detect if it's a host or a device and then uh, the 3.0 and 3.1 have added the the super speed differential receive and, and transmit pairs. So that that's basically the the really 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 high level view. So if if you look at the the actual uh, protocol and the specification, it's it's around 600 pages long and it's pretty pretty detailed. So it's it's it, it's good to look through if you have have a lot of time, but and want to get into really some of the really low level details. Uh, but uh, a lot of time and a lot of coffee. Yeah, yeah, totally. Uh, but the, the these uh, bottom layers, like the uh, the uh, the physical link and protocol layers, those are primarily handled in hardware. Like all the all the major devices, that's all done in hardware. So it, you it's possible to find vulnerabilities in these, but it's kind of hard, and it's uh, it can possibly require expensive uh, equipment. Um, so we we basically were we're trying to just focus on places to get started. So 
Uh, we're, we're looking at the, uh, the function and device layer and give, giving you guys some bigger pictures of how USB is actually implemented in real modern platforms today. So th there's also uh, th this idea. So like the, the idea that if, if USB is involved, there's, there's, there's the question of do I need physical access to plug something directly into the system? And there's a, the bad USB talk over at Black Hat with Karsten Noll and Jacob Lell uh, was, was a, a good talk this year, basically describing how to subvert uh, some, some really commonly used devices. And it has people talking about like filling the USB ports with superglue in order to prevent this type of attack. But you, there, in, a, in a modern platform, basically any laptop that you have is going to have internal USB devices. So the, the, uh, the HP that I was looking at earlier has three different USB devices internally, and all three of those have upgradable firmware. And the, the question is, like, the, the, val the validity sensor is a, a, a fingerprint sensor, and it has actually an AES block, and that one actually does... Uh, a secure firmware update in a, in a smart way. The, uh, the Broadcom and the, the webcam, those also have updatable firmware components. So the, if, if, if you have a firmware, like completely arbitrary, arbitrarily controllable device in your, in your platform already, it, it could actually do some pretty interesting things. And it's something that's not observable by, observable by the host. So the, the host doesn't have any ability to look inside of this because it has its own non-volatile storage. So if, if you do a firmware update of this device in your system, there, there isn't really a good way for the, the host to actually determine, or like your malware software, to determine if this actually has been updated. So it's, there, some devices have hardware that can, you can force an update. But some devices, the, the update software is in, it's controllable by the firmware. So once you've, once you've updated the software in this device, the device is actually controlling whether you can do another update afterwards. So if you do update it once, if there's malware running on your system, it's, it's questionable whether you even have the ability to clean it s successfully. And uh, so th an another thing is that, like, with this, with this particular device, this is a, a sync cable for an older phone, and uh, yeah. So e even even devices that you might think are are fairly simple can can have some uh, interesting ramifications. This this uh, is just a, a phone sync cable, and it has a, a complete USB to UART bridge, and it has a, a complete 8051 core or 8052 core. It has its own boot ROM, and then a, a uh, RAM and SRAM, and it, it loads a uh, firmware off of uh, this uh, external I to C chip. So it, it actually has this complete, it, it can be arbitrarily controllable. You can rewrite the, uh, the vendor ID, the, the VID and PID, so it shows up as a completely separate device. You can change the uh, USB device descriptors and this is something that's all controllable over USB. So you, you can just basically just send, uh, uh, let's see. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so the, this device actually has a number of uh, vendor-specific USB requests. And some of them are like, you can tell it to, to reboot. You can tell it to force force uh, execute, execute the firmware that you provide. Yeah, we're going to see a demo yeah. later on. Yeah. So basically, you can you can tell it. In, you, usually, it'll check the the I to C, uh, check the signature, and the signature is basically four bytes. It just checks if there's four bytes to see if it's programmed at all. It doesn't do any kind of integrity or verification of what's actually in the I to C uh, chip inside of here, and then it just downloads whatever firmware from the host. Otherwise, you can send this request to it and get it to directly take whatever whatever you want to send to to the device. <laughs> So you, you can basically, a, after, the, after the system is booted up, malware can send, the, send a, a completely arbitrary firmware update package to the, to the device and execute whatever you want, have it reconfigure itself as a, a human interface device, mass storage, 
or a, a whole variety of different, different options. And this, this is just directly described in the data sheet. So if, if you find this particular, this particular uh, controller, it, it even describes here's how to, send, uh, how to send firmware updates through this device. And in the data sheet, it even specifically says, uh, these requests are primarily for internal testing only. These functions should not be used in normal operation. But yeah, it, it, it's, you, you can find really interesting things if you search for this type of thing in data sheets. So <laughs> if, if, if you're writing malware, it's like this is the type of thing that you want to find because you, you can take advantage of these debug hooks because there's, this is designed for updatability and test functionality, but there, there isn't anything that, that stops it from being used after it's provisioned and, and deployed in the field. So you, you, can, you can take advantage of some of these debug hooks and upgradeability hooks to, to do some pretty interesting things. And this, this particular uh, USB controller is, is used in a whole wide of range of different types of devices from this little uh, USB sync cable up to like multi-thousand dollar network infrastructure devices. So you, you can find it in some pretty interesting places and, and this, this type of capability actually exists pretty commonly. So even like, like I was mentioning, just devices that happen to be already in your laptop, uh, you, you possibly have something that is arbitrarily controllable and can be used already in the laptop that you have currently, and there isn't really a good way to de determine if it's been, been uh, modified or to, to really verify the integrity of this particular device that's already in your laptop. So some, some other things in this uh, USB, in the uh, uh, specification is it specifically describes how to read and write to this non-volatile non storage that, that it, uh, that it uh, loads its firmware from. So, so some devices you end up where you can do an, do an update and send a, a malicious packet payload to it, but then it's gone once you reboot. But this, you can be completely persistent. You can send it a malicious update, and then they, they reboot, they shut down the system, it's still running. So when the system comes back up, this thing can potentially uh, enumerate as any type, of, any type of USB device, including a HID device, and send, send uh, malicious scripts. Send, like, it, it could also, like, if, if it's, if it's attached when the system is booting up, it can uh, do it can uh, like send keystrokes when your system is booting even instead of in, instead of like if if you have some malware that's running on the system. Uh, actually, I should I should probably talk about that in a second. But uh, so the, there actually is a, a device firmware update specification, and uh, this the the original version was uh, released in 1999. And it, it talks about how to create devices with upgradable firmware. And they, they go into this all kinds of detail about what to, what to do, but they don't actually mention security at all. There's, there's no mention of how to actually protect the, the, the firmware in all of these devices. Uh, they, they do describe having a, a simple checksum, which is not, it's possibly useful for integrity, but if, if you have somebody who's actually creating a malicious payload, that's completely bypassable. So, the, and the, it was updated, the, the, so the first version came out in 1999. They came out with an updated version in 2004, but they still don't mention security at all. It's just talking about integrity, making sure that you can update the, the firmware, but there, there isn't really anything talking about how to do that securely. And we, we've run into a, a bunch of cases where uh, a, a lot of different vendors do uh, use the, the, the DFU device firmware upgrade spec, but they, or they, they, they will follow this and they, they also will, but because many devices are relatively low power, they, they aren't going to go through the, 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 pro, the, the whole case of having something that uses full like uh, RSA signatures or any kind of public key signature verification and actually checking the firmware before it runs or before it updates. So they, they basically will just do the integrity check and that's it. So that's incredibly easy to spoof. And for people who, there, there are some devices that they do 
they do care about security more, so they they will do this this uh, uh, complete security check and like do signature verification. But it's much more of a just on the fly, and they there it's it's custom. There isn't really any uh, approved way to do this, so they're all kind of rolling their own firmware update, which has its own issues. So like some sometimes they get it right, sometimes they don't. So, but the the vast majority of your devices they they just don't even bother to have any kind of security. So it's it's fairly trivial to to update the these devices and. Just get get firmware get, get your own firmware running on the device, and have arbitrary code execution running within the USB device. And if if you have that, you can do some pretty interesting things. So we we like to talk about like attack surfaces. So instead, you, like a lot of people will think about the uh, just the host and then a device and then a USB cable in the middle, and you can just disconnect that. But there's there's actually a lot more going on in the system. So there's like an application. You, there's, there's a, a variety of applications. You might have virtualization going on where you've got some virtualized guests. And then even within the, uh, and also, also there's a couple different privilege uh, levels just within the, the OS itself and the, your host because there's a BIOS, SMM, uh, there, there's a CPU which has some, some interesting capabilities. And then uh, within the, the device itself, there's uh, the firmware and in, in some devices, that can be as complex as it's running a complete Linux distribution inside the device. So there's, there's devices that just have really, really simple, like just a little hard-coded firmware. Others are running a complete OS. And it, it depends on what they're, what they're trying to do. But if, if you have the complete, compe the, the complete complexity of an operating system running in your device, there, there's much more likely to be other security vulnerabilities than that, and it's, it's, and, and also especially with, uh, with people trying to get devices out and into the field, uh, time to market requirements and trying to get devices out into people's hands, they, they aren't necessarily going to spend as much time validating things and making sure that it's as secure as possible because they want to get it out and make a sale and, and get it out there. So. So there, there's a, a variety of different uh, interesting things going inside both your, your host and your, your PC, it, it, the host and the device. And uh, it's, it's likely happening inside your laptop. So instead of just thinking of, of a device that you need to physically disconnect and you don't even, like if, if you want to be, be careful, like protect yourself and like, like I, I don't know that I trust getting USB from this guy, but if, if I like, unwrap the USB device myself and I only use that for myself, it's, it's hopefully going to be okay, it, but there, there's the, the devices that are already in your laptop that could be compromised. We, we've had issues where uh, devices have come from the factory with firmware, with malicious or compromised firmware and viruses on the devices. But if, if you have something that's already in your system, there, there's some... <clears throat> Uh, interesting capabilities and uh, that malware can take advantage of. Uh, so the the devices in your system, some of them also have radio interfaces, like uh, the the description of the uh, uh, the 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 device manager screenshot that I showed earlier. One of the devices that I had was a, a Bluetooth interface. So this is talking to outside, so it also has the attack surface of Bluetooth. And if somebody can like if, if there's a, a Bluetooth, also like 3G modems, a, a variety of different devices have other uh, external interfaces. So it's, it's not a situation just where malware could potentially reprogram this, but if there's a vulnerability within the, the radio firmware, you can take advantage of that, uh, that attack surface to, to get as a foothold into the system. So if, if you, there, there's a variety of different ways you can get arbitrary code execution within the USB device where either there's malware running within the system already, maybe in a virtualized guest. So like in VMware and VirtualBox and other virtualization systems, you can pass through a USB device to the guest and have the guest get direct access to that USB device. But if you have uh, malware running within that virtualized guest, 
it can do a firmware update to this USB device also, which can, can cause some interesting problems. So if, if you're getting uh, arbitrary code execution within the USB device, you can then use that to, to attack other components within the host. So if you, if you have one virtualized guest that reprograms the USB device, you can potentially use that to escape confinement or inject keystrokes to, to BIOS when the system is booting up. And there, there's a, a variety of other different, uh, different ways that you can attack this. So the, the controller that we were talking about earlier and showed the data sheet for, we can, we can arbitrarily control the, 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 the VID and PID of that device. We can change the device descriptors, so what specific device classes it shows up as, that's arbitrarily controllable. You can also, uh, from, the, from the device side, uh, force a disconnect and reconnect. So it will, you, you can reconfigure the device, disconnect, and that will be then re-enumerated in the host. But when, when that's been passed down as a virtualized guest, it basically shows up as a, a physical disconnect, which causes the host to, to re-enumerate the device. And because it's a different device, the virtualization software generally uses the, the VID, PID as this is what is, this device has been passed down to the host. But when it, when it basically shows up as a disconnect and reconnect, it, it actually can escape confinement in that way. So you can inject keystrokes to the host instead of the guest, which is, is pretty interesting. Or another example, if you have a USB to LAN adapter connected to a guest VM, and you happen to reprogram the VID PID to be the same company's uh, USB to LAN adapter, but a different type of product, most likely uh, the, same, the two chips will have the same functionality. The, the, the VMM will get confused and connected to the host, and then you have an entire, an entire network attack surface to the host. And yeah, th and this, this type of a attack can happen whether it's a, a physical device you've added or there's, if, if there's a device, a USB device already in your system. And like my, my phone here has the, the USB modem, is the, uh, the cellular modem that I get access to, the, the cellular network, that's a USB connection also. So it, like, what, what, are, what are the chances that the, the baseband firmware has no vulnerabilities? Why haven't we, why we haven't tested that? I, I've, I've played with it a little bit, okay. not, not, not a lot, but. Still works though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so basically, like, if, if, if there's a vulnerability in the, the baseband firmware in a phone or something like that, it, you're, you're basically getting arbitrary access control within this USB device, and then you have to basically bridge the gap across a USB interface to actually get access to the, to the host. So you, there, there's actually a, a pretty interesting uh, project uh, called uh, uh, Catalia, I think, that has a, a variety of different really interesting uh, payloads for human interfaces devices to present to a host over USB. So you, it, you basically go to this, it's, I think it's a Ruby script, and you can say, I want to generate this payload to, to uh, like get credentials from a Windows device. And it can do some, some really interesting things. And you basically generate this payload, it creates an Arduino sketch, but it's really easy to, to take that payload and, and use it for other purposes if you're not using something with an Arduino. It was designed to be used for like with uh, teensies and that type of, of device, but it has a, a, I think it has like 30 or so different payloads that, that are pretty, pretty useful other than just like directed browsing, like download and execute and getting malware running on the device, but it can do basically like adding a user with admin permissions if the, the, the user that's logged in has admin permissions already. So like that type of like, it, it uses a PowerShell for, uh, for sending payloads for Windows. It also has a variety of Linux payloads, Mac payloads. So it's, it's a, a pretty flexible framework and it's, it's designed for penetration testing, but it's, it's basically a, a, good, uh, a, a good way to understand what you can actually do if you have if you have a, a USB device that you control and you can arbitrarily program. So I, I, I was intending to add a slide for that, but didn't, didn't quite get that. But it's, I, I believe it's Catalia, 
So yeah, uh, we have a couple it, of references. It's on, yeah, it's on GitHub. So we have a couple of references to yeah. give you guys yeah. later on. And, uh, and, and another thing that a, a lot of people don't realize about is that there's uh, this uh, debug capability within uh, USB. And uh, that actually allows you to get low-level debug access over USB. And uh, it's, it's been added to uh, Windows logo certification. So basically any device that runs Windows, it's going to support Windows, uh, this uh, debug capability. And y y you can basically get in and like, do kernel debugging and stuff over USB. And some, some other vendors are, are doing some more interesting things and basically using it as a low-level debug protocol. But with the, the EHCI version, it was around, but it required special hardware. So it, it wasn't used as much other than people like writing OSs. But with the, the XHCI version that's, that everybody has now for the last year, couple years, it, it basically will go through uh, standard USB hubs. It doesn't use any kind of any special hardware, so it's it's actually pretty easy to take advantage of and, and play around with. So, yeah. <laughs> and there, there's also this thing called a media agnostic USB that has just recently come out. the The 1.0 spec was just released in February of this year, and they basically are are taking the entire USB stack and swapping out the the low level physical link uh, areas. So you can basically have US, the full USB protocol and stack running on top of a wireless link. So they, they basically are designing this so you can have like the, the complete complexity of USB over Wi-Fi or Y-Gig and some other protocol. So they can, the, the, the initial version of the spec is specifically talking about Wi-Fi, Y-Gig, and they, they're making it flexible enough that you can have other transport mechanisms. So so it, it ends up looking kind of like this, where you've got this, the, the, top, the, the top parts are the, the, the protocol agnostic le level, and then everything else is being transferred over USB or over uh, Wi-Fi or some kind of wireless radio communication. And there, there's, some interesting, uh, there, there's some interesting things because it can actually, in, instead of like pairing and like having to enter credentials, it can do like auto discovery, and that's... That's something that we really want to take a look at. The, we, we haven't seen the hardware for this yet, but we, we think this is going to be really interesting, and we wanted to give you guys a heads up about this particular technology because this is, this is on the way, and I, I think it'll be pretty cool. So we, we wanted to talk about some tools basically to, to, under, to let you guys know what's out there and uh, available to, to get started with this. So uh, the, the, the total phase will be Eagle 5000. Uh, we've, we've got one of these here. It's, it's, a, it's a, a nice device. It's kind of expensive, but it, it does support USB 3 super speed, so you can do uh, protocol analysis and understand what's actually going on, even with high-speed devices. But it's, it is pretty expensive, and it can only be used for observation, not injection. So it, it has some, some limitations. Uh, there, there's also, if, if, you, if you don't care about the 3.0 like super speed, there's also the uh, Beagle 480, which is uh, less we expensive. So yeah. we, we've got one over here for some uh, demos. It's, it's a lot less expensive, but it only supports 2.0. And like the, the 5000, it, it can only be used for observation. So there, there's also the ITIC uh, uh, protocol analyzer. This is even less expensive than the Beagle 480, but they, they kind of break it up and some of the software is sold separately. So it's, it, it depends on what you're doing, but that, that could be pretty useful also. But you, most of you have probably heard of the face sensor that uh, Travis Goodspeed put together, and it's, it's really nice. A, a friend of mine soldered this together. He was, he was excited. He didn't have the, the, the right resistors for a couple of these, so he ended up with the... Uh, the uh, through hole parts instead of the surface mount parts, and th this is this is really nice because you can basically do you, you can emulate any kind of USB device and basically write a Python script in order to to do it. But because it has a complete round trip through the device to your host running Python, this script it can be really slow. And we ran into a bunch of issues where it was way too slow for what we were using it for, and we had to kind of come up with a, an alternate solution. 
Do you, do you want to describe that? Or? No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't want that. We don't have time anyway. Okay. So there, there's also the uh, Daisho project that uh, Michael Ostman, Dominic Spill, uh, Marshall, Jared, Mike, and Ben are putting together. And this, this is intended to do like full USB 3 injection, high speed uh, protocol analysis and man in the middle. But they, they, we, we were hoping to be able to demo it here on, on stage, but it's not quite ready yet. But if, if, if you guys uh, are interested, just, just pay attention to it. Uh, it. It should be out very soon. But I've, I totally want one of these, and I, I think these will be really useful. So there, there's also the uh, USB proxy tool that uh, Dominic Spill is putting together. It's basically uh, uh, taking a beagle blown black, and he, he's created this, uh, yeah. So. So th this is a, a cheap little device, but it has a, a USB host and device port. So you can, you can uh, he, he has a, a, a tool that he can run on there, and he is, his release image is basically a Debian uh, installation, and you can do complete man in the middle of USB 2 devices. And I, he's, he's uh, giving a talk in the Hardware Hacking Village, I believe, and, and demoing this also. So uh, he's... It's just one guy so far, Dominic, but he's he's taking contributions, and uh, it can already do some pretty awesome stuff. So uh, he he has a demo of being able to uh, uh, do like on the fly write protection of USB devices or like changing changing requests on the fly. So he he has like a keyboard that's doing ROT13 while you type. Uh, just as a simple demo, but you can you can do like arbitrary modifications of of the of the content that's happening on on the device. So I, I this is a great device, and his his software on that is 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 pretty cool. So if if you're looking for just software, there's a libusb, and that that's a good way to to get to uh, start using the. Uh, the, the devices, even if you don't have any hardware. So you can install the libUSB, in, install the, the, device, the, the device driver so that you can, you can talk to the, specific, to the specific USB devices. And this is another way that if, if, you, if, if you're talking to something that's like physically soldered down to your motherboard, you probably aren't going to be able to like stick a beagle in the middle, but uh, you, you can use libUSB to send requests, do firmware updates, explore that space. Uh, another thing we're doing is we, uh, Mickey created some uh, Peach publishers. Uh, these are on the, the DEF CON CD. But it basically is uh, uh, hooking up uh, Peach, uh, which is this, this awesome fuzzer that, that we love a lot. And uh, it's, it's hooking up to LibUSB so that you can do a variety of different fuzzing. Uh, different, different fuzzing uh, which we're going to show in a minute yes, in the demo. Yeah. Yeah. And we, we've got a, a data, data publisher, configuration publisher, and some sample pit files. Those are all on, on the CD. So it's just, you can just build the solution. It's a Visual Studio solution. Yeah, I'm going to show that in a second. Yeah. Uh, there, there's also this uh, 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 Fison uh, PS2303 framework, which is, I, b I believe the Fison is the, uh, the chipset that uh, Karsten Knoll and Jacob Lowe were talking about with their talk over at Black Hat. But uh, this this framework is is also on Bitbucket. It's been around for uh, for a while, but it, it basically it has a similar capabilities as the control that we talked about. It has an 8051 compatible core. It has its own RAM. It can run firmware off of the NAND, and they're they're basically creating this project to to uh, use these uh, flash drives as a USB three B USB three development and penetration testing platform. So. This, this is a, a, another great thing for you guys to check out. And uh, so now we, we wanted to give some minutes. demos. Yeah, like 10 minutes. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> okay. Can everyone see a Visual Studio window? <laughs> No. Really? Do you need to duplicate it? I'm duplicating it. I'm doing it again. How about now? Awesome. All right, so 
This here is a USB to LAN adapter. Okay? For my next trick, I'm going to plug this in. <coughs> if I succeed. And I'm going to show you this little piece of code that uh, gets the VIDPID, connects to the device, and reads the VIDPID, which are stored on an EEPROM on the PCB in this thing. Now, There, there is a data sheet that I want to show you guys that is publicly available for this device. And it has a, the USB core interface and it talks directly to the EEPROM. And one of the beautiful things about this thing is if you look in the data sheet, you find USB vendor commands, <laughs> which will give you the exact bytes you need to send and receive in order to read, write, Write enable, write disable, in case you need to write enable if it's disabled, and a whole bunch of other stuff. So I'm going to run through this. Uh, right. It's running here somewhere. There you go. Now I'm going to change the VID PID for this thing. And before I do that, I need to show you what it changes for. It changes to, sorry. For this demo, I'm using libusb.net and libusb. So if you see under libusb, I have the network uh, device. If I look in here, the VID is 170F and the PID is 7203. So far, so good. I'm going back to my tool. I'm doing write enable. I'm changing the VID, changing the PID, write disable. And to double check, I'm reading it back from the EEPROM. Now, the device is still connected. The IC is still powered on in the PCB. There is a way to, in this specific chip, to uh, trigger a hardware uh, reset on the pin. I haven't found that yet. It's, it's, the spec says it needs to do something. It doesn't really do it. So uh, in order to simulate a reset, I will plug it out and back in again. And now we have a Microsoft keyboard. Thank you. Now for the fun stuff. I hope you all have the DEF CON CDs. No? OK, cool. So in the CD, you'll find this USB for all solution that has um, the, all you need to do, all you, need, all you ever need to fuzz USB, basically, with Peach. If you don't know the Peach fuzzing framework, I recommend you Google that. It is an awesome fuzzing framework by Deja Vu. And in the solution, I hope you can see this. Oh, this is going to be nice. There are... Bit files. Bit files are the descriptors, the descripting files that you give to uh, Peach in order to fuzz things. For my uh, first demo, I'm going to use the data publisher for Android ADB. I need to plug a phone here. I'm using a, a prepaid Android phone. Again, to do this, you need to replace the driver. LibUSB um, requires you to replace the driver. Basically, it gives you ring three access to ring zero uh, driver to talk to any device you want. So if I look at the Android ADB pet file, all I'm, say, all I'm sending to the device is uh, CNXN and host. It's two first the two first values you need to send to an ADB to start authenticating. Uh, for the new Android stack, you need to do secure authentication and all that. So to keep it simple, these, these are the values that this example sends. And if this works, we should get a reply from the phone. So now, I'm 
going to do, I'm going to run Peach. I'm going to do a dash one because I want to run the first iteration. Uh, in the description, it says if you're missing it, the dash one performs a single iteration, which is going to be run without fuzzing. So whatever value is set to, it will run for this example. And I'm going to do a dash dash debug so I can see the debug outputs from the from the publishers that I've wrote for, that I've written for this, uh, which will allow me to see the response getting from the device. So you can run this on any Android phone without using any sniffer, and you can get a you can see if you can get a response or not. Here's the ADB example. So hopefully this works. Here we go. So we sent uh, CNXN and host, and we got back CNXN and device. To show you I'm not lying, I have a sniffer here. The total phase 480 that we talked about. And I'm going to run now, and it's on the line. And I'm going to run this thing again and turn to the sniffer, and you, you'll be able to see that we're sending CNXN and host, and we're getting back from the device CNXN and device. So if you know Peach, you can take it from here. If you don't, pick it up. It's really nice. Are we on time? Oh, four minutes. That was Android. Now, I have the same thing for an iPhone. It's a little bit of a different technique. Uh, ADB is based on data. Data transfers, the, uh, the iPhone is more of a control transfers. I need to put the iPhone in recovery mode. So give me a second. Come on, come on, come on. Ah, of course it won't work. Yeah, if you have any questions, this would be the time. Where do babies come from? <laughs> <sighs> I don't know. Why do you have to put the iPhone in recovery mode? Hmm? Why do you have to put the iPhone in recovery mode? Um, it's the simplest example. It's the coolest one, though. Are you aware of any software-based uh, sniffers for Windows? Are there are software solutions for sniffing on Windows. Anything uh, that's free? Hmm? Anything that's free? There are some that are free, but there are some also that they, they look like they're malware. <laughs> <laughs> Well, like a, like how how to do it correctly or yeah, like somebody already wrote it. So this is, this is library you should use, or an example library that you should use to download programs. I I don't I don't know if there's a, a good like here here's a good place to go and use this for your USB device. The the go. the other issue is that just because these are they're they're often like low low cost devices. They they aren't very very, very high powered like an eighty fifty one. If you're doing like a full RSA twenty forty eight algorithm in that, it might take a little while to to boot up and enumerate. So like with, with the USB spec, it's supposed to be able to boot up as, as soon as you plug it in. I, I think it has like a hundred milliseconds before it can before it can before it needs to be responding to requests on the USB device on the USB bus, but. If, if you have something that's really like a, a really low powered device, it might not have just the, the the computational power in order to do like a full signature check every time it boots up. So it, the, I think I got thirty seconds. Keep going. Okay. Is your demo ready? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Uh, real quick, iPhone demo. Say all again. All these files are on the CD. Uh, what I'm going to send to the iPhone in recovery mode is this: get environment RAM, get environment RAM disk size. Which, if this works, should return 40k in hex. I'm gonna have the sniffer running. Oh. Here we go. We're receiving in a buffer 40k in hex, or 400k, or 4 million, I don't know. But uh, this is one of the commands being sent to the iPhone in recovery mode after a new uh, uh, image is being uploaded to the, or before a, a firmware image is uploaded to the phone. So you can get around this size and it's one of the commands that you get. So for the demo, you can do this with iPhones. 
control transfers or any uh, any other thing. The uh, uh, ten seconds. The uh, the other example on the CD is for this uh, USB LAN dongle. You just change the VADPID to uh, whatever matches uh, your, your hardware and use control transfers according to the spec you have, and you can do it yourself. And that is it.